Let's start with the before lecture chant. An unsurpassed, penetrating, and perfect dharma is rarely met with, even in a hundred thousand million kalpas, having it to see and listen to, to remember and accept. I vow to taste the truth of the Tathagata's words. Good morning, everyone. So today um, we're going to be talking about uh, chapter 21 in the book we're studying, which is the, the uh, heart of the Buddha's teachings by Thich Nhat Hanh. And this particular chapter is entitled The Three Jewels. And you might know this topic as the three gems or the triple gem in Buddhism. You might know this as the three treasures or the triple treasures. And maybe there are other expressions that, that you're also familiar with. But in these pages in the book, we are refamiliarizing ourselves with the basic foundations of our path and our practice, which are the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And of course, as you know, um, not necessarily every week, but we often recite our vow to take refuge in these three. And I wanted to share with you what they sound like uh, or Thich Nhat Hanh, they're slightly different. His version is, I take refuge in Buddha, and he, this would be a chant. I take refuge in Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. I take refuge in Dharma, the way of understanding and love. I take refuge in Sangha, a community that lives in harmony and awareness. For some of us, this, this vow to take refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha actually may have been one of our first steps to a formalized commitment to and a faith in the Buddhist path. When I was starting to spend time in Thailand and becoming familiar with Theravadan Buddhism, I remember the impact of combining what my practice was then, which was sitting and doing a lot of reading by myself I remember when that was combined with chanting for the first time. And the first chant I ever spoke happened to be in a Thai temple where I was with some friends and we walked in and those of you familiar with how this looks, uh, at least in Southeast Asia, is you, you walk in and you sit down on the floor, uh, legs crossed to the side for women, hands in gasho, and the chant was this. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa. And to all my Thai friends, pardon me for how that might sound to you. But this is repeated three times. And obviously the, the monks are in the lead on this. And at the time, I actually didn't know what it meant. And I asked a few of my friends. Um, and they said, hmm, I'm not sure exactly. But I did find out that this, this, this very common chant in, in Theravadan Buddhism means I pay homage to the Blessed One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. And this moment was in a way rather transformative for me in that, well, as, as chanting can be, it, it was as though I could feel my commitment sort of reverberating in my physical body. And this then coming together in a spiritual way of my mind and my body and my heart. And it was also just so beautiful in this, in this wonderful temple and the low soft voices of the monks that are seated all around the, the temple up off the ground. Um, a meeting of the senses, if you will, that filled me up in that moment. And in some ways, I still feel that today because that was a beginning for me. So taking refuge as we do can and does connect us in ways perhaps we don't think about too much or too often. But what exactly are we taking refuge in? And actually, what is it? Thich Nhat Hanh begins this chapter writing of, of how secure or at least 
reminding us to think on how secure and protected we, we might have felt when we were in our mother's wombs. And for him, to seek refuge means to look for a place like that, that is safe and a place we can rely on. This is a place we can trust. And I think there is healing power in this, even just knowing such a place can and does exist for all of us. In Buddhism, he reminds us, taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha is not blind faith. We're not just accepting a theory about it, what someone else is saying or writing, but rather we are encouraged to see for ourselves, to experience it. Taking refuge then actually is the fruit of our practice. And when I first started on this path, and perhaps you too, the Buddha and the Dharma for me came in the form of the books I was reading and occasional words from a Thai monk at a temple I was visiting. And my Sangha originally was a Thai family I spent a lot of time with in Thailand. And a few Thai friends there with whom I discussed Buddhism and obviously other things too, that tied us together. And again, the temples that I visited from time to time and the monks I was able to talk to. And if you think back to your beginning steps on the path, perhaps it's similar to you, but here we are now. And most assuredly, the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha have been revealing themselves to us more fully in so many ways over time. He reminds us that our faith is concrete. It's not blind and it is a fruit of our own experience, experience which has given rise to insight. Indeed, it is not blind, it is informed. And what are we taking refuge in exactly? Well, the Buddha in whom we take refuge is most often thought of uh, not only as the historical figure of Shakyamuni, but also that might include numerous Buddhas that the teachings tell us came before Shakyamuni Buddha, and also those that will follow after him, along with many of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas who are seen as enlightened teachers on earth and in other realms as well. And similarly, the word Dharma can have a number of meanings, but traditionally, and today for us, it refers to the teachings of the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni. And in some other, some other traditions, it also refers to those of all enlightened beings, the teachings of all enlightened beings. So for some refuge in the Dharma may encompass a more expansive view also, where in refuge, and the Dharma may mean finding support, for, for example, in this vast universe that we come to see as simultaneously empty and perfectly complete. And lastly, Sangha, the Buddhist community. And traditionally, it referred to the community of ordained monks and nuns, but today, Sangha obviously includes all Buddhist practitioners, lay and ordained. And our understanding and our experience of Sangha can also be much more expansive than this, whereby taking refuge in the Sangha means embracing kinship with all living beings, for example. All things, in fact. An interesting part of this chapter um, is that Thich Nhat Hanh shares a cultural aspect of taking refuge that is common among Chinese and Vietnamese practitioners, which is that they add to the recitation of the refuges. I take refuge in Buddha. They add this. I go back and rely on the Buddha or the Dharma or the Sangha in myself. And he reminds us that we ourselves are the Buddha. So that when we take refuge in the Buddha, we should also understand that 
the Buddha takes refuge in us. Some of you may remember in the Lotus Sutra that myriad bodhisattvas vowed to the Buddha that when he died, they would carry on his teachings, that they would be his feet and his eyes, his ears and his voice. And the Buddha entrusts him or herself to us in order for understanding, love, and compassion to be alive in the world. A quote from Thich Nhat Hanh. Without us, the Dharma cannot be practiced. So it has to be practiced by someone. And without each of us, the Sangha cannot be. So when we say, I take refuge in the Buddha, Thich Nhat Hanh also hears, the Buddha takes refuge in me. When he hears, I take refuge in the Dharma, he hears the Dharma takes refuge in me. And I take refuge in the Sangha, the Sangha takes refuge in me. And I'd like to share um, this chant that he adds, adds in this chapter to further express this idea. And it goes like this. Going back, taking refuge in the Buddha and myself, I vow together with all beings to realize the great way in order to give rise to the highest mind. Going back, taking refuge in the Dharma in myself, I vow together with all beings to realize understanding and wisdom as immense as the ocean. Going back, taking refuge in the Sangha in myself, I vow together with all beings to help build a Sangha without obstacles. Adding in myself makes it clearer to us that we are in fact Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So we can also know that we take refuge in ourselves. And the Buddha taught that each of us is responsible for our own path of awakening. We're familiar with this we've, and we've talked about it. In fact, as he was dying, uh, it said that he told his attendant, Ananda, to be a light unto yourself. And at the same time, as we have all experienced, the Buddha left us other precious legacies, the teachings and the community. So as Thich Nhat Hanh suggests, Buddha is our mindfulness. Dharma is our conscious breathing. And Sangha is our five aggregates working in harmony. Those that we mentioned in the, in the um, Art Sutra. Forms, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. But how do we take refuge in these? If Buddha is, if Buddha is our mindfulness, then our refuge is in our mindfulness practices, whether it be breathing practice, sitting, eating, walking, or mindful listening. Reading and listening to recordings or watching videos can all be of value, of course. But we're reminded by Thich Nhat Hanh that Dharma is more importantly revealed through and of our life and our practice. There is a reference in this chapter of the 84,000 Dharma doors. <laughs> this is uh, something that is specifically stated in the Pali Canyon, Canon, which is the collection of uh, uh, sermons, if you will, or teachings in the Theravada tradition. And these, these um, go ahead, could, could you check? We have a knock at the door just a moment.
Excuse me, everyone, for just a moment. Welcome, Kay. So these 84,000 Dharma doors, <laughs> something that was new to me. Um, and it's a metaphor, obviously, for the innumerable paths to enlightenment. And each path is illuminated in a sutra containing a distinct teaching to ease suffering. So we can easily see that, for example, sitting on our cushions is a door as is walking meditation, for example. But importantly, to take refuge in the Dharma is to choose the doors that are most appropriate to us. And sometimes we don't know which door would be most appropriate. So to realize these, Sangha helps, and sometimes it's necessary. As already mentioned, Sangha is a community of monks and nuns and lay women and lay men, along with any other elements that support our practice. So to Thich Nhat Hanh, we can include in our Sangha, our cushion, the path we step into in walking meditation, the natural world around us, the trees, flowers, the sky, all of it. These elements all make up our Sangha, that which supports us on the path. And Thich Nhat Hanh emphasizes that our Sangha is essential to our practice. And I love the metaphor he uses to express this. He says that if we sow seeds in arid land, few seeds obviously will sprout. But if we choose a fertile field and invest our seeds there, the harvest will be bountiful. He's very, very clear about this. Building and supporting and being with a Sangha, receiving the support and guidance of a Sangha is the practice. And we obviously see this here with all of us when we are together. Sangha can help shine a light on our own views and perspectives, which helps us to see ourselves more clearly. Now, my first experience with a larger Sangha, other than the family, the Thai family I was with, was in Thailand again, and I was visiting, um, spent some time at Wat Pa Nana Chat, which is, called, which is the um, international forest temple in the tradition of Ajahn Cha, some of you might know him. And this is up in Northern Thailand. And the, the, the Sangha in this case was what we call the fourfold community, as mentioned above. It was monks and nuns and lay women and lay men from the community who came to support the monastery in various, various ways, like um, cooking and offering food, cleaning, things like that. And then just visitors who show up for periods of time, like myself, um, so we all worked and practiced and sat side by side. And I felt for this first time something that Thich Nhat Hanh talks about, which is that being among all of these committed people, it strengthens and supports one's own faith, one's sense of refuge. In them, I could feel and hear and see not only Sangha, but Buddha and Dharma. And I saw their mindfulness, which also helped me see my own mindfulness. I heard their joy, I also heard my own. And in fact, it was there that I first deeply within me had this shared sense of oneness. It was a beautiful experience. But as I said also, Sangha can really point us toward our less helpful habits. And I had been there just maybe for a few days. 
And we were sitting, we got up at, we, we started our first sit at three in the morning, by the way, which is very traditional in Thailand. And uh, we went until uh, nine o'clock. So we were sitting a lot throughout the day, not continuously, but still. And um, sitting, oh, so is my, well, I, well, it sounds like I'm feeling sorry for myself. We're sitting on a flat surface, not on a cushion. So it was, it was a change for sure. Um, and I was really hurting, as we do in Sashin, in retreat normally, actually. So I decided um, to ask the abbot if I could uh, use a chair. I'd seen a chair out near the, where, where we cook. And uh, so I thought I would talk to him about that because he has times during the day where he's willing to talk to people. And so I was standing behind another woman who was talking to him. And I really didn't want to hear their conversation, but I could, it was an open air area. But during that time, I was thinking how I wanted to express how much pain I was in and how I needed his help and so on and so forth. And I felt kind of whiny, actually, and really kind of into my own suffering. <laughs> and then I heard him ask the woman with this most compassionate voice and expression, because I was, I was you know, just this far away from, from, from them. And he looked at this woman and he said, how are you feeling? You know, I know you've been in a lot of pain. And I thought, yeah, pain, that's right. Me too. But it turns out this woman had come from France. And she had come here because she was at the end of her life with a very painful form of cancer. And she came here just to sit, just to get some sort of peace and joy in this, in this environment before returning home to essentially live out the last months of her life. And he said to her, please, use this chair if you need to rest or do whatever that supports you. <laughs> yeah, the perspective of Sangha is invaluable and those around us. And after they had finished talking, I was still standing there but I wasn't standing on very firm ground. My legs didn't seem to hurt as much. My mind was calmer. The internal story that had just been fired up to support my right to sit in a chair just sort of unraveled. And so the abbot then turned to me <laughs> and, and I simply uh, didn't have that entitled attitude anymore. I did ask if I could get up during our normal sessions and walk a bit or sit in a chair if one was available. And he said, of course, you just need to do what you need to do to support yourself. But I tell you that this and so many other examples of my ego sort of taking flight in, in just a moment. I had a lot of those during the time I was there. I was there for some weeks. And seeing one's ego like this, being the one who can catch it, can watch it and see it is an invaluable perk that is sometimes just sort of lit by Sangha input. In this case, it was the abbot and, and another Sangha member. So the Sangha becomes our mirror in a way. And these precious jewels enter our, when we take care of one, we take care of all. These three precious jewels are not mere notions. And in the words of Thich Nhat Hanh, they are our life. <laughs>